Biebs. Um, we're starting just a little bit late, so I'll keep the introduction shorter. First of all, um, good morning to everyone. This is the second day of the conference, and uh, yeah, good stuff, good stuff. Now, I'm super happy I can be introducing our next, next speaker, George Marquez, uh, because GDScript holds a special place in my heart. You see, I'm a self-taught programmer, and I'm not, I know I'm not the only one. Because of GDScript, I learned how to program. Right? I did. I went into C Sharp. It was the concepts of programming. C Sharp, I, I even dabbled in C++. You know, when I did that, I was like, okay, right. <laughs> success right there. So yeah, um, George is here to tell us about the past, the present, and the future of GDScript. So please, welcome him. Hello. First of all, I want to thank everyone for being here to attend uh, not only the conference, but also my talk. Uh, I'm recovering a bit from flu, so I apologize if my voice is not the best or if I have to stop a little bit for water. Um, and let's get start. I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, let's introduce the topic, uh, and I'm going to talk about myself first. Uh, if you don't know who I am, I'm um, a Godot contributor since 2015. It's, it's, it's been a long way. Uh, I'm a maintainer of uh, a member of the Godot Foundation board. I'm a maintainer of the JavaScript uh, implementation currently. I am responsible for a lot of big changes. I broke a lot of stuff in JavaScript. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I also did other contributions in other areas of the engine. I contribute to GD extension. I am. Uh, I did a few things with UWP platform as well and some other stuff. And what is JavaScript? I think that's a good point to start, as if you didn't know what it was. Uh, it is a gradually topic, typed language, which means that you can use a dynamically typed, but you can gradually add a static type into it. So it's, uh, you can measure how much you want of each, each type. It's an indentation-based syntax like a Python, uh, I guess mostly Python, uh, <laughs> uh, which is actually very good for, for uh, formatting purposes because it forces you to go that good formatting. Uh, it's tailor made for Godot. It's the language that's very specifically made to work inside Godot with Godot core and everything. It was focused on gameplay programming, so a lot of the some of the re resources that you can do in the language. You, uh, as focused for specifically for a gameplay. And it's fully integrated in the editor. You have like an IDE uh, that you can edit code. You don't need to leave the Godot editor to editor code. And, and it's simple, but it's a powerful language. It's a, you can do anything you want, except some things, but <laughs> <laughs> it's a very powerful language. You can do just a lot with it. And I'm going to just go back very briefly about the internals of the language because I plan to mention them in the next few slides. Uh, so we can all understand what we mean by when I say like the tokenizer, which is also known as a scanner in the textbook, which is essentially gets the source text from the from your file, from JavaScript file, and converts everything into something that we, the computer can understand a little bit better instead of just individual characters. Like you have the if keyword, it just instead of the I and the F characters, you can just understand as one single thing. And it goes through the next step, which is the parser, which checks the structure of the language. And it makes sure the syntax is correct. And give errors if not. And otherwise, it creates a, a tree structure so you can use on the next steps. The analyzer is like the what checks the types, checks the semantics, make sure that the code uh, are more solid. Uh, we have the compiler. I mean, it's called a compiler in Godot, but it's like the code generator. Usually, it's called the code generator in the textbook, which creates a byte code, which is essentially like a binary representation of some instructions. And those instructions are run by the virtual machine. And the virtual machine you know, just reads the byte code and actually runs the things that 
you want to run. All right, let's start with the past. Why does JavaScript exist? Um, there's a lot of other languages out there, you know. Why, why do you want my favorite language? Uh, languages have been tried in the past. Like before Godot was open sourced, uh, Lua and Squirrel and Python were tried and they all had some issues. And uh, there's some difficulty in embedding the languages into the engine. Some languages like Python was not really made to be embedded anywhere. Uh, other languages like Lua and Squirrel was, but they have other problems. Uh, you have to convert types between the engine and the, the language. Like, if you have a vector2, Python doesn't have a vector2. So you have to convert to a format that Python understands, and that conversion just takes a lot of the performance away from, from the language. Uh, you have to also make like a glue code. You have to make sure that all this, this conversion is happening. There's a lot of code just to make it, the, the conversions happening, and everything communicates with another. Um, sometimes multi-thread is very difficult. Like Python is specifically is the most difficult one because it's just not made for, for multi-threading code. So just create a language that is simple and is tailor-made for Godot. It has uh, a, a variant, the variant type, which allows different types to go into the same thing, the same like uh, container, let's say. Uh, it was already there. It already needed, even if other scripting languages uh, uh, were used, you need something like that. It was already there, so let's, you, let's use it. Uh, it's actually gl making GDScript, at least at first, was just simpler. The whole code was simpler than the glue code to another language. Uh, and it can talk directly with the Godot types. If I have a vector tree in Godot, it's the same vector tree in GDScript. You don't have to convert anything, so that makes it much more convenient. And you also can integrate syntax. Uh, like you have signals, and you can put that straight into the language, into exports, and whatnot. But why does GDScript still exist? Because, I mean, it has not been a long way since the, 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 those, those problems happened. Uh, but the thing is, there is still the same problems, essentially. Uh, this thing about conversion code, the marshalling, uh, the glue code, the threading, uh, is also problems in a lot of languages. And now we have a great ecosystem in JavaScript. Uh, there's a lot of material that you can find and tutorials, and it's just going to throw everything away for another language and you're going to like start from scratch. It doesn't make a lot of sense. And the language is just getting better. I mean, there's a lot of people working on it, and the language is not the same language as well. You know, it's now a much more established language. But what about C Sharp? Because, I mean, C Sharp is also supported. Uh, directly in Godot, first part support, and you have C++, and you have like community bindings like Rust or Neem or some other languages, and I think they fulfill the niche. So if, if you like Rust, you can use Rust with Godot, that's not a problem, but I mean, people who are using GDScript would not like swap to Rust or even C Sharp for, for that matter, because there's a lot of overload, uh, overload of things that goes on with that. Uh, the, the thing about marshalling or the conversion like between types, between the engine types and the language types is your problem because C Sharp also does not have a vector2 type. So you have to do some things to, to make sure it works. And C Sharp, the C Sharp integration does a lot of things to, to make it work, which takes a little bit away of performance. And I mean, just they are not meant to use as scripting languages which it kind of requires fast prototyping. You want to make your code. You don't want to wait for a compilation, for instance. We just want to run and make sure it's already working, because you want to get the feel of the game. And there's you, I mean, it's not free to integrate. You still need uh, things to integrate. And like in C Sharp, you need to install .NET in your machine to make sure it runs. So even if you embed it in Godot, it's just not as convenient. Not to mention the garbage collection. 
So uh, JavaScript, uh, as I say, is not the same language. It has evolved over time uh, and has a lot of improvements in bug fixes since it was open source. So it's a different language, even though it's similar. It's much more con much more reliable now. Uh, and as I say, a lot of has been rewritten, and that makes it like m better and more maintainable as well. Uh, in a lot of things that existed when the first open source commit of Godot now just uh, it's gone. It was replaced for something better. What remains is mostly like the API bits because the API has been not changed that much since the beginning. Like the scripting API in Godot and the editor also included new features and also is getting better and easier to use. So enough of talking about the past. Let's talk about the present. And of course, about the present, I mean going back to go to 3.0, because I think that's the really major big point in the Godot history that uh, started really like the modern Godot. So what happened in Godot 3.0? We had the match statement. We had properties. Before we had like get and set functions, like get position and set position. In Godot 3.0, you now you can just get assess the position, which allows you to do like plus equal something, which is before was like impossible. And it's been there since uh, Godot 3.0, which was released in January 2018. That's a long time ago. Uh, we had the anums. We also had a contribution by Hein Peter to improve the VM performance, like for a good amount. Uses some GCC extension trickery. Doesn't really once you get to deep into it, but uh, it just improved a lot of the performance of the VM. And in Godot 3.1, which was released in March in 2019, we had the optional typing system. Uh, which I work with personally myself, uh, and it's like a really optional system because if you don't want to use it, you don't have to. If you want to use it like partially, you also can use it. And also added warnings, which allows people to like get potential mistakes that are not really hard errors, but might be a problem, so they can like get aware of those. Um, also, that I mean, that warnings also work in a non-typed code, by the way. And you also added the class name, which allows global classes and showing them up in the add a node dialog and the add a resource dialog as well. Good at 3.2 uh, was released in January 2020. It introduced the language server protocol, which is a way to communicate with external editors. So if you have like a VS Code or if you have Emacs or Veeam or something like that, you can have a client on the, your editor that communicates with Godot and get information about uh, the scripts. So you can get like errors and warnings showing in your editor uh, so we, without having to actually implement anything special in, in the editor. And yeah, but the internal editor also got a lot of improvements. You got the ability to make it bookmarks. You had the minimap on the side. Helps helps like find things in longer code. Uh, have an indicator for signal connection. If you connect the signal in the editor, uh, the script editor is going to show a little icon next to the function that's connected. So it makes you aware of that's happening. And uh, evaluate selection. Just have a math expression. You select expression and then just type a keyboard shortcut. It just converts to the result of the math expression into the code. So it's a very small thing, but very convenient. <laughs> And Godot 4.0, we're going pretty fast here. Uh, it was released like this year in March. And it has a complete rewrite of the parser, which uh, um, helped a lot in the maintainability scenario. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning, it has the parser and the analyzer. And before, everything was like in the same file. And it's a little bit complicated. Some people uh, mistook one thing to another when contributing code. So. It was some, some mistakes happening, so I decided to split that into different classes. So they're also smaller files. They're easier to work with. The parser is more like a textbook parser. So if you're a bit familiar already with programming languages, you can like, understand what's going on much more easily. And that improved a lot of the, the maintainability. 
Uh, we have better error detection as well, uh, which allows multiple errors to be detected at once, which can take it for granted. But like before, in Godot 3, you already cannot. You just have one error. If it's one error, it just stops there. But in Godot 4, you can have multiple errors detected at the same time. Uh, we have a better type system. Uh, the nums that we were introduced before now can be used as actual types. You have also signal, first class signals and first class callables, which are the, the functions. Like if you uh, reference a, a function by name, it just became a callable and you can call it somewhere else. You can pass them as function arguments if you want. You can store them in arrays. This has a lot of other possibilities. And also it reduces a lot of the use of strings, especially for signals because you can just access the signal by name, and then you can connect a function with by name itself, and the editor can catch, can catch some errors and typos and stuff like that. And you also have a documentation page for scripts. So you can add little comments in your script, and that's going to show up in the documentation together with all the class reference that you have in the engine, also have the reference for your scripts. It's really great for plugins and third part code like that. And there's more things using Godot for. Uh, we improved the handling of dependency cycles, thanks to Adam Scott here. <laughs> <laughs> really nice thing, now you don't have this problem out of dependencies. You can use it much better in Godot 4. Uh, we have the await keyword, which replaces the youth keyword. Uh, essentially, it makes it much, much simpler to use. Uh, use a different keyword to make sure that oh, it's a different thing, so people cannot be super confused. And it's much, much easier to understand. You don't have to deal with any implementation detail. Uh, we also add annotations which reduce the number of actual keywords, which also helps like if you have a variable names and stuff like that. Uh, it can interfere if you have like the same name as the keyword. And with annotations, we can just create a new namespace, let's say, for the for these special keywords like export and RPC and tool and stuff that are not really directly part of the, the script itself, but uh, we can just add more without like compromising the, the keyword scenario. And we have like many, many performance improvements in the VM, and most particular for typed code. If you type it code, uh, your your script, the compiler can figure out that some things must always be true. Like some types, this is always a number. This is always an integer. So I can make sure like it's an integer plus an integer. Just call the function that that sums both. I mean, I don't need to check the types at runtime. That just makes everything much faster if you use types. And we have a test suite. I think that's a really big thing that's not shown to the general public because the public doesn't doesn't see that. But we are adding like test cases for for GDScript, which allows us to catch regressions. Like if there's a bug, we usually make a new test that reproduces the bug and then we fix it, and then we make sure that newer change is not going to make the same bug happen again, because you can just catch in during the, the pull request phase. And um, more of the present time, Godo 4.1 and 4.2. 4.2 has not been released yet, but it's probably going to be like in a few weeks from now. So it's just including everything that's already there. Uh, a lot of things are went for stability. And the, the tests that I just, just mentioned help with that. We have like almost 500 test cases in, in GScript right now. Um, we added static variables, so some things that you need to be like persistent all the time without have specific instances. Most people use an autoload for that, but sometimes an autoload is not really the best option. You can just need a static variable and a lot of our requests. And we make sure that uh, all the problems that we have with static variables were solved for this particular thing. And we made, we included this in in 4.1, I think. I think it's already in 4.1. Yep. And have a raw strings, which if you have like a backslash in your string, you just don't need to escape it. And that might looks like a small thing, but if you do a lot of regular expression, it just it makes everything much more readable. 
We have the thread supporting the debugger. It is a 4.2 feature, uh, which is the, something also that has been requested a lot. And if you have threads in your code, debugging it was always super difficult because the debugger does not stop, and that has been fixed. So if you have an error, uh, a runtime error in a thread, the debugger is just going to stop in the editor, just like any other error. You can see like all the threads, what's going on. You can put breakpoints in threads as well. And you can see the values and anything, everything that's supported right now is also supported for, for threads. We have the pattern guards, which are special things for, for match that allows you to specify a, a, a condition for, for a case. Not going to get into super details here. But the very common thing in all the languages support match pattern. And it was finally added into the script as well. And we have like more VMR optimizations, including some optimizations that do not require types or anything. If you're not using types, just in some cases, also getting a little bit faster. Whew. Conclusion. Uh, it has like been a long journey for, for JavaScript since the open source or even before that, but especially since the open source part. And uh, JavaScripting is getting bigger. It's not just me. There is not only Adam, as I mentioned before, which <laughs> which is also making like the regular meetings. So it's, it's really good because we have meetings almost every week. And we can discuss things with the team. We can discuss, oh, there's a problem here, or there's a, this proposal. What do we think? There's this PR. What you, what we think about that? And we can like make sure that JavaScript is always getting like better and better. And there's like a lot of ideas and from the community and from the team as well. And the proposal systems that we have. So you have an idea for JavaScript. You can just go to the Godot proposals repository and open a new proposal, or maybe you want to open a discussion to discuss first with the community what everyone thinks. And we constantly like check that to see what, what's the interesting thing, what what's the people are asking for. And yeah, I think that concludes the present house. Just, I think that's the, the part that most people are <laughs> expecting for this talk. So the future there's no JavaScript anymore. We just remove it from the engine. <laughs> no, that's that's not true. So I think the the first point that I want to make is stability. I think that's like super super like first one topic that I want to make sure it works reliably. It's it's important that you you do not like. You do not find bugs in the in the language. You should not be finding bugs in the language. I think it's important that if you find a bug, it's it's your it's your fault. It should always be your fault. <laughs> it should not be my fault. So the first, uh, the most things that helps stability is tests. Uh, we can like assess that because that has been happening with with GDScript. Sometimes we make a PR and then the test fails and then wait, wait, why the test fails? And then if I okay, this is introducing a bug. This is not the way it's supposed to work. So we can make sure that everything is work as we expect it. And we expect even after changes, we can we can keep this this assertion that works. But not everything can be tested. So that's why once we improve the test system should test some things that currently is like impossible to test, like the auto completion, uh, the integration at the editor that includes the export variables, the doc generation, some other stuff, the hot reloading, which is kind of also uh, part of that. Um, there's some issues already, like with hot reloading, and sometimes we want to make sure that the bugs are not reintroduced, but it's very difficult for now because there is no way to test that. So we want to like think about a system how to do test those things, are the tool scripts because since they run on the editor, they have a little different things the way they work, and we want to make sure that we want to test those as well. And I think that's like most thing for stability because we can like always ensure that JavaScript is working as it's supposed to work. And if we find a new bug, we can add a new test case. And then we make sure that this bug is not going to happen again. And there's also a part about the internals, which 
uh, helps with the stability because uh, if the internals of the JavaScript implementation are cleaner, it means that more people are able to maintain it, more people are able to understand the code and help, and it helps. Um, and even though like a lot of things has been redone for for some time, uh, there is still some stuff that are old, and there's like stuff after the refactor that we end up like patching and stuff like that. So you can stuff you should have stuff to clean it, and that helps all the new contributors because uh, it's much easier to navigate a code base. Even if you are familiar with it, it's much easier if the code is very well organized. And also, it's easier to, to fix bugs and add new features, which I think is something that everyone wants. So even though the delivery factors and the internals are not really, like, you, you cannot see directly the results of it, you can see like that the progress is can be made faster by doing those things. And the existing tests, and hopefully the new tests, as if we can do it, uh, helps the avoid regressions, which are essentially like things that were working now, but after a change, they're not working anymore. We call that a regression. And having tests avoid uh, th th this from happening, even if you do like a huge refactor or something like that, you can make sure, oh no, it's JavaScript to work in as it is triple to work. And of course, we want to make the code like run faster. We want to take less time running code in improving the VM performance. It's uh, one thing that we have in mind all the time. Uh, and we want to investigate ahead of time compilation and GIT compilation, just in time compilation. And just a quick brief if you're not aware. Ahead of time compilation just means we take your script and like in the editor we just compile it to a binary code, to directly machine code that just can run exactly. So like when you export, you just create the machine code and then you run. You just like as fast as it can be because just running directly into the in the, the processor or just in time compilation it's kind of like that but instead of doing like in the editor you do at, at runtime so when, when you load the script you can pile your machine code and then you can run on the current machine that's running and we are looking to proposals that would improve this this performance in some other ways like you can use allow vm as a backend which is used by a lot of languages out there, so it's a very established thing. We can also use transpire to C code, or maybe C++, and use the uh, uh, existing compiler for C, and that would make the code, essentially is the same as a head of time in compilation, but instead of comp compiling directly, we just compile to C and then ask the C compiler to optimize everything, and we have only do half the, half the job. Or using uh, WebAssembly, which on uh, web we can just like use the browser itself, but we can also include a runtime for other platforms. There's also something that has been proposed, and everything is just something that they want to look into and do research and search what's like what's feasible, what's the best option for us. Um, oh, uh, this uh, idea of uh, un intermediate intermediate representation kind of clashes a little bit with other things. But the idea is just, instead of using JavaScript, JavaScript right now is just the source code. So you just load the source code, and then you compile, and then you start that until you need to run it. And my idea is to just do this, comp this compilation part beforehand and save this in a format that can be stored in the, in the disk. So you can start that like in the PCK during export, and then at uh, the release, when you load the script, there's no script anymore, there's just this uh, code that can be really fastly converted to bytecode and then run on the VM. That improves not only the loading times, which can be a bit complicated with like big scripts and big interdependencies between scripts, but also like some people has been asking for obfuscation of the code and that allows you to not start like the plain source code into the into the final release of your game. So another good point that we want to improve is the editor. Uh, make sure that uh, like managing your JavaScript code is better. Uh, first of all, it's code completion. I think it's a tool that everyone uses like all the time. 
Um, so I'm going to improve it, make sure it's working as best as we can do it. Uh, some refactoring tools, which allows you to rename like variables and functions without having to actually manually check for everything. Some options for static analysis. Um, for instance, I wanted to make a tool that analyzes your whole project and can get like a script and know that's connected to a particular node in the scene and how it interacts with other scripts because by default JavaScript only knows about its own file. It doesn't know anything about the scene. And I want to make sure that's some better options to find errors in, in bigger code bases. Uh, better information in the editor, like if you hover a variable, there's a two chip that says like the type of the variable, for instance. I think it is being worked on right now. But there's other things that we can do in the editor as well. And to like make essentially more usable and easier to use and have more tools and allows you to stay in Godot without needing to use exert external editors. It helps a lot of just just the facility of doing that. And of course, there's the new things, the new features uh, that we want to make JavaScript more expressive, which just means that you can like do more things with less words and do like more ex special things. And the first one is traits. It's something that I've been working on, uh, maybe 4.3, maybe. Uh, it's essentially a mix between like the mix themes and the interfaces. You can use these as purely as interfaces or protocols. Essentially, just oh, this class must adhere to these interfaces, must have these methods, for instance. But you can also like add code to those methods. So you can have like a default implementation and you can share this between multiple codes without having to deal with, with actual inheritance or stuff like that. Uh, nullable types is something also has been worked on lately, uh, especially if you use uh, primitive types like integers or vector2, which is like primitive in Godot. They're not possible to be new, but they are uh, the idea is that you can like maybe uh, add an option that okay this can be either something or no, which helps a lot with some some cases with types when you need uh, like a, a default value or something. Uh, type a dictionary. The we have already typed arrays, but there is a few issues with typed arrays that we are looking to correct and make sure that like all polished before we add the type of dictionaries because the same issue is going to happen with dictionaries. But I think we have like in a good path to, to finish that really soon. Uh, we have a struct, which is a being a proposal, a more recent proposal and kind of an implementation as well. We have a lot to discuss about this, but it's something that's like happening. And there's something that we I, I don't really want to promise. But uh, there's a lot of proposals that have been super popular. And I, I figure we want to mention, because we're going to discuss it. We're going to see if it's feasible, if it's, it's possible, if it's something that makes sense to the language. Because like adding things to the language is easy, but removing things to the language from the language is impossible. So when you, we add something, we want to make sure that's, that's the way it's going to be like forever. Uh, one thing that I like is access modifiers. Uh, I have a protected and private variables or functions, and something that's maybe it's visible in the constant context of JavaScript and being object oriented also makes uh, a lot of sense to have those things because it's a very staple thing. Uh, array unpacking, which does exist in a few languages as well, uh, makes it easier to pass values like from functions and two functions as well, uh, not, but not only array, you can like maybe think of dictionaries or maybe even a vector two or vector three that you, you want to pack into something. Uh, namespaces, which mostly for plugins, especially like because when you create a class in your plugin, you don't know if there are other plugins that might be using the same name or maybe the user code wants to use the same name and have some clashes. So having everything in more compartmentalized makes sense. Uh, variadic functions, which is something that is supported in Godot, but not in JavaScript. JavaScript does not, c not create a function in JavaScript, even though you can access some functions that uh, exist in the engine itself. So it's something that might be really possible to implement if you get you know the syntax and all the details right. 
uh, abstract classes and functions is a, also a proposal that has been a lot of activity lately and might make sense. We want to investigate again, uh, talk with the team and see if that's something that we can go forward with. And a code formatter, which uh, we have like a G-Request uh, made like a essentially funded a, a contributor, multiple contributors actually, to work on a code formatter for for GDescript, and there is a pull request. There is some issues with the current code, but maybe we can work on polishing it out and finally have something that helps a lot of the uh, of uh, the formatting of the code, which is really good to uh, for a team as well, because you can just make sure that the whole team is using the same style and everything. It's much easier to work with, and of course, uh, other things. <laughs> Uh, there's a lot of proposals in the repository, and some has been like really upvoted, and we're look we're looking at those that has been like, okay, the community seems to be wanting that, and we want to discuss with the team, maybe make like a, a priority list. What do we work on first? What do we work on later? Maybe we don't work on this at all. Maybe we'll work on something else. But that's like something that also the community can particip participate because we, we are in the rocket chat. If you do go into the community tab of the Godot Engine website, there is a link to the rocket chat where all the contributors are there. If you have a cash question about the code itself or about some proposal or something like that, you can go there and ask. We're just there. It's not like a hidden thing. It's not, it's not a secret. It's not a secret club. We just open for everyone. And I guess that's it for now. Uh, there's still a lot of things that we we know we need to do for JavaScript, but now we have like a good team, and it's just not me. I'm not lonely anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we just need to consider everything. As like I say, they just easy to add something, but it's impossible to remove something. So that's why we just don't, oh, I, we don't accept this, makes it super obvious, but I mean, it, it is obvious, like, but maybe in like a month from now, someone is going to find a problem with it, and then we could have figured it out beforehand, and then now you have to either break compatibility, you're going to suck for everyone, or you're going to do some patches that's going to also suck for everyone, so that's why you always consider everything super carefully and I believe that the, the future JavaScript script is really bright. I think there's a lot of things that are going to happen and there's already a big community and a lot of things in the future it's just going to be a super great thing. It already is but it's going to be better. <laughs> and I guess that's it for questions. <laughs> So, Jorge, this is not maybe a question, but rather like uh, an acknowledgement of your work, your hard work for GDScript. Uh, a lot of things that you saw in 4.0 and 4.1, and even before, uh, when you listed the past of the of the and the present of Godot, like is from you. So maybe we could uh, we could like uh, applaud Jorge uh, for his hard work. Thank you, thank you, everyone. Hi. Um, so I'm new to Godot, and sorry, if, uh, I apologize if this is a stupid question. Um, but you talked about like the deep engine integration and like ahead of time and just in time compilation, and I wonder how it is uh, done right now. Like, is it uh, interpreted completely? And what I want to know exactly is. Uh, what about modding support? So, if I have a build, uh, is it possible for the community of my game to contribute with GDScript? Okay, that's a good question. Um, so, right now, what we have is like we load the source code of your script, and we just compile to byte code, and that's stored in memory and choose the time to run, essentially. Um, and that if you have like 
if you have GHT compilation, it's probably going to be the same thing. It's just going to happen that when you're compiling to byte code, you also compile it to machine code. So this is, I mean, for modding, it's going to be the same. Ahead of, com ahead of time compilation and some other possibilities do take away this, but what we can do is uh, essentially I have like a, a duo approach where you can like you can choose to keep GDScript like fully dynamic in the release build in your export template. Otherwise, we, we can just remove a little bit of GDScript. Also, it can makes the export leaner for people who don't need this this functionality. So you can like choose what you want. That's all. Hi, um, great talk. Um, I was curious. You mentioned like uh, null-level integers. Is this something that's going to be um, explicit, like um, similar to C++ or Zix, or, um, or or like any integer will be able to be null? Yeah, this is, is something that's explicit. So right now, if you have an integer, it can never be null if you if it's statically typed. The idea of a nullable is, is to be optional. So this can be an integer or a null, but it's just explic explicitly typed. And then you have to check if it's null or not before you can actually use it. Yeah, hello. Maybe I missed that, sorry. What is the situation about exception handling? They try or catch? Yeah, so right now, I mean, there is nothing like that in, in Godot. It just. Uh, JavaScript kind of fails gracefully if you have a function and it gives an error. It kind of like returns the function and whatever else happens, you know, after it, it's just going to keep going. We have, uh, I don't think it have a lot of the bean discussions about exceptions or stuff like that. So it's something that, I mean, if you want to make a proposal about it or want to discuss it more, maybe open a discussion in the Godot Proposals repository, because right now there's, no, as far as I'm aware, there's not really any, a lot of interest in this, in this thing. Hi, uh, thank you very much, and thank you very much for GDScript. I was a big fan of C Sharp, now I'm a big fan of GDScript. Um, I have a question about the, the static typing. You earlier said that it is obviously more performant if you use types. Can you give us a little hint on how much of an improvement it is, so we can like better decide on that. Uh, it depends a lot of. <laughs> There's a lot of factors into it, like some operations are like two times faster, some operators are like five times faster, or something like that, uh, depending on the function call and how it how it goes through the interpreter. I mean, generally it is faster, but I mean I. The exact amount is very difficult to choose, to say, just it depends on a lot of factors. Hi. Uh, so yeah. Uh, great talk. Thank you. And um, the nullable, um, is there nullable pointers as well? Or is that a plan in the sense that you might want to annota uh, annotate pointers to be non-nullable? Like the inverse thing, basically? Yeah, like the, I mean, pointers. I assume you, you I assume you mean like reference to objects and stuff like that. That by default they are nullable. Um, that's something that I consider, but I'm not sure there's a lot of discussion in this in this sense. So maybe you need more, more, more time to to mature that that idea. I'm not really against it, but I don't think there has been a lot of discussion on this one in particular. Yes, uh, thank you for your amazing work. Uh, I was kind of interested uh, because one of the proposals that was more of a maybe was abstract uh, classes uh, and functions. And I was interested with the traits that seems to be kind of like interfaces. Like I, I would want to hear like how it kind of differs, uh, you would like you would say from an interface slash abstract class if it's kind of an in-between. So I would want to hear some kind of expansion on that a bit, how, how traits are going to end up working. Sure. Um, so the, the idea of ab abstract classes is just a class. It has some like some, like some stub functions that you have to implement when you inherit it. And it's kind of the same with traits. The difference is more like the relationship. Because 
uh, with uh, with a trait, you can essentially like add multiple traits to the same code and stuff like that. But with when you inherit an abstract class, you're kind of fi fixed on only one thing that you have to do. Um, I mean, they're very similar in a lot of a lot of ways. I'm not sure if I can like figure out a very specific difference for that besides the idea. But if you look at the at the engine itself, there's a lot of classes that are abstract, and you might not aware about like the button. There's like a base button class that's not really something that you want to inst instantiate, but you want to make a derivation of that. And that's kind of the same use for other things. Maybe you have like a huge tree of things that are connected by inheritance, but they have like a base. And you don't want you to be a trait. You really want you to be part of the inheritance tree. But you don't want anyone to instantiate that, or you don't want, or you want to force like the the inheritance to actually implement these methods. And that's kind of how you use this as opposed of as opposed of traits. <coughs> So in the future improvement, you mentioned about uh, documentation, out to documentation generation. But also, I saw in the present, I think you mentioned something about documentation. Uh, is there, like, currently supported uh, any documentation generation, or is it just a future idea? So the documentation that happens right now is, like, just in the editor. Uh, so if you have a, a class, you can just comment that's already uh, is already working. So you just add like specific comments, and then it shows like in the class reference together with the other ones. That's not like an external thing. I'm not sure if that's what you mean, but I mean for the future, that's not really because it's already there. So maybe I'm not sure if exactly when I mentioned about in the future. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, we have uh, typed arrays. You mentioned typed dictionaries, but is there like an idea? Uh, is there like an idea for more general generics, as as you say? Yeah. So there is a lot of discussion about about this because when adding typed arrays and dictionaries, there's a lot of thing in the core of the engine that like it does not really lend itself well. For, for this kind of thing, so you're thinking about like going back a step and make sure the engine has a concept of type that works well with everything and arrays and dictionaries. Maybe then we can consider something like generics because it's an extension of that. But I'm, as far as I'm aware, there is no proposal for that, and we usually like try to focus more on what the community like uh, are more interested about first, you know. Any more questions? Okay. okay. If nobody talks, then I will talk. So uh, <laughs> you, you said that you were, you were not alone in the GDScript team. I could maybe uh, shout out maybe some members of the team. So there's Daleksiv, Daniel, Daniel Alexiev, that is a huge, huge contributor right now. Uh, he, he is a, our wizard of GDScript. There is, uh, there is uh, Ocean that uh, contributes a lot. There is also um, uh, I, I, Dimitri. Dimit Dimitri uh, that contributes. So, well, I am, and there's a lot of newcomers too. So, uh, yeah, we're not alone, and we have a lot uh, of pe new people. So, that's great. And if you want to contribute, just join the chat.godoengine.org, and uh, let's talk. All right. Okay, then, peeps, thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for coming.